And on Tuesday next week, we'll talk about uh, computational advertising and, uh, and algorithms that allow us to do that. And today, we will talk about how do you match advertisers and uh, customers. And then on uh, Thursday, uh, Michele will give a lecture to talk about how do you discover which ads are good for which people. So essentially, whenever you have a content ecosystem, the problem is that you have the content, but you don't know who is it good for. So you kind of have to try out different users to learn over time who, re who this content is good for, right? If you have a new movie, you don't know who likes that movie. So you want to go and strategically show it to a couple of different people to figure out who likes it. And then you can actually decide and learn who to show it to, right? And this is kind of an exploration problem where you want to go and identify who will like a given ad uh, beforehand. And this is what we'll talk about Thursday. Uh, there are two more things to say today. First is that we have the CS341 info session today at uh, 6 p.m. in the Gates 219, the Gates common area. Uh, please come to learn about uh, all the exciting research projects uh, that you can apply to to work on next quarter as a part of CS341 class. Um, if you cannot make the session, the slides will be published on the course uh, website and you'll be able to browse through and actually learn everything about the course. Um, and then the last homework of the quarter is due this coming Thursday. Um, good luck, you did an amazing job, is the last one uh, great. Okay, so where are we in the course? We are here talking about infinite data, the processing data streams, and web advertising is one example of streaming algorithms. So this is what we'll talk about today. So essentially, what I want to define is this notion of online algorithms, where the classic model of the algorithm is that we get to see the entire input, all the data at once, and then compute some function over that uh, input and uh, return the answer. And this is called offline algorithm because it gets to see all the data uh, at once. And then online algorithms are algorithms where we get to see the input uh, one piece at a time, and we make some irrevocable decision along the way. And after we've seen one input and made the decision, the next input arrives, right? And this is very similar to the data stream model. Only here, basically the examples or the elements come after one after another, and we have to make some decision. Now, what is the model of advertising we will look at? So if you say, how is Google making money? It's making money by basically filling in this matrix where you have a lot of advertisers and advertisers bid and say, what queries do they want their ads to be shown for, right? So you have this matrix of advertisers who bid on different keywords and whenever somebody comes and asks a query of this type, all these ads are el eligible to be shown to that, uh, to that user, to that query, right? And uh, now, of course, if you have all these candidate advertisers who want their ad shown for that particular query, we need to select which ad to show to what query. And notice that, for example, um, the same way as multiple advertisers bid on the, um, want to show the ad for the same query, the same advertiser is interested in many different queries, right? And the way we can model this is the following. We can model that we have these advertisers uh, 1 to k. And, uh, right, um, and the idea is that the advertiser wants to show an ad for a given set of queries or a particular set of keywords or topics. Right? So whenever a new user shows up, let's say that user A, then let's say this user types in a query such that advertisers 1 and 4 one are eligible to show the ad to that user. Right? And then, you know, a new, uh, and we make a decision. We maybe make a decision that advert we will show the ad one to user A, right? And then the new user arrives. And this user asks a different query. So it is maybe uh, advertisers two and three who bid it on that query. So now out of two and three, we have to decide who, who to show, uh, uh, which of the two eligible ads to show to the user B. And let's say we chose um, uh, ad number two, right? And then let's say, a user C comes, and the user C enters such a query that only advertiser one is interested in, um, in showing the query, uh, showing the ad to that user C. And in this case, right, because in, maybe the advertiser one only wanted to show one ad, 
we run out of budget, so we cannot show an ad to user C, right? And then a new user, let's say D arrives, uh, 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 ad, uh, advertiser number three uh, is the only one who bids on this particular user. Um, and let's say that advertiser number three is not yet, uh, still, does, still has the advertising budget to use. So we would now show the ad three to user D, right? And so on and so forth. And what is uh, what is uh, abstract instance of this problem? This is called a graph matching problem, right? Because I have a graph, a bipartite graph, and I'm trying to match um, uh, nodes on the left to the nodes on the right. And node on the left can be matched to exactly one node on the right, right? So this is why is this an online problem? It is an online problem because you have to make these decisions: what advertiser to match with what user. Um, based on uh, uh, as this graph gets revealed to us, right? So as new users show up, we have to decide what ad to show to that user. And after we show the ad to the user, we cannot show that same ad to some other user later on. We already used our opportunity to show the ad to the first uh, to the first user, right? And because we don't know how user in what order the users are going to arrive and what kind of queries they are going to ask. This is an online problem, right? The, the opportunity to show an ad, the user arriving to the site and entering the query is revealed to us one step at a time, right? While let's say the advertisers come ahead of time and they say, this is a set of queries we want to bid on. This is the number of key, uh, this is the amount of budget, number of dollars we want to spend, right? So what I want to talk about now is talk about this kind of abstract notion of, um, online bipartite graph matching, right? So this is the first thing. We'll talk about a problem in the abstract, and then I'll kind of bring it back to this problem of matching advertisers to, to uh, users or to opportunities to show an ad, okay? So online bipartite matching, what is the example? The example is that we have this bipartite graph with the left and the right hand side. Um, uh, we, let's, uh, for, uh, you know, let's be old fashioned, we'll have boys and we'll have girls. And the idea is that, right, um, I have this graph where boys or, um, and, and uh, the things in this graph reveal preferences, right? And my goal is to match boys to girls so that the, the most preferences are satisfied, right? I have uh, the two sides. Each edge means a preference, right? So this would mean that, for example, boy number three would be happy to be matched with the girl B uh, or D. Girl uh, B would be happy to be matched with the boy uh, number two or boy number three. Right, and my goal is now to 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 uh, what is called find a, a maximum matching, which will be find as many pairs of boys and girls such that um, as many preferences are satisfied. Right. So here is one uh, example of the matching. Right. Each boy is uh, mapped to uh, exactly one girl, and uh, the whatever girl is mapped is only mapped to only uh, one boy. Right. I cannot split the node. So this would be one example of the matching where I'm able to find the cardinality three of matching, right? I match uh, by obeying the preferences. I'm able to match uh, three pairs of uh, boys and girls. So cardinality of my matching equals uh, three. And of course, you could ask, is there a better way to do this? Could I match all four boys to all four girls? And if you look at this uh, uh, sharper, here is actually a, 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 a perf what is called a perfect matching because we are able to match every boy to every girl um, again obeying the same set of preferences, right? So if I would match uh, um, uh, boy number one to the girl C, boy number two to the uh, girl B, and so on, I'm matching everyone. Uh, I'm kind of I find a perfect matching because every boy and every girl are matched again obeying the preferences, right? So uh, some terminology. Perfect matching is a matching where all the vertices in the graph are matched. And then maximum matching is a matching that contains the largest possible number of matches, right? So a perfect matching is always a maximum matching, but a maximum matching may not be perfect matching, right? If I would have a lonely boy here that uh, uh, would have no preferences or no girl would select a preference for the boy, then this, this case wouldn't be a perfect matching, but it would still be a maximum matching. Okay, so that, that is the idea. So now the problem is how do I find the matching for a given bipartite graph, right? Basically, find the maximum matching or a perfect one if it exists, right? 
There is a very nice polynomial time offline algorithm based on uh, the idea of augmented paths by uh, Hopcroft and Karp. Here you can read about the algorithm that will find you the maximal matching. What this algorithm assumes is that the entire graph is given to you ahead of time. Our goal is not to know the entire graph ahead of time, but what if we don't, the question is, what if we don't know the entire graph up front, right? And this is an example of the online matching, where the graph is not known to us um, uh, ahead of time. So here is now what is the online graph matching problem, right? We will be, we will know a set of boys, and at each round, uh, one girl's choices will be revealed, okay? Um, and that is basically the girl will come and we will know her, her preferences. She will reveal her edges. And then at that point in time, we have uh, two choices to make. We either pair the girl with some of the boys uh, she revealed preferences for, or we do not pair the girl with any, with any, with any boy, and you know, the girl is unmatched sitting on the side. Okay, so those are the two options, right? We either decide that the new node that arrived, we pair it with one of her preferences, and this way it means we kind of reserve that boy for the girl, or we say, uh, sorry girl, we decided not to match you, you sit here on the side, okay? So that's the idea. What's an example of this type of uh, problem? For example, assigning tasks to servers, right? Tasks are arriving one after another, right? So boys are the servers, girls are the tasks. Um, the task arrives, says um, I'm able to run on this particular set of computers, right? This is my set of preferences. And then what we get to decide is to either schedule a task on, on a given server or say, sorry task, we are not able to schedule you, please wait, right? This is an, on, this is an example of the online graph matching problem where every task has a set of preferences where it can run, and as soon as we assign a task to the server, that server is now kind of off the market. It's, it's been consumed by that task, okay? So give you an example. Uh, here is my uh, uh, set of boys, and the way this will work is, you know, girls arrive one at a time, and they reveal the preferences. And we get to make a choice either to match the, to, to select one of these two boys to match to the node A, or, or we, we, we do nothing, right? And imagine I decided, yes, somehow I will match A with the boy number one, right? And now the second, second girl appears, reveals its preferences, and again I somehow decide who, to, who, do, who do I match uh, her with, right? Now the, the next girl appears, reveals the preference, boy number one is already taken, so I cannot match this girl with anyone, so she remains unmatched, right? And then the, 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 the node, the girl D arrives, reveals the preference, node, B, node three, boy, boy three is still unmatched, so I can create, I can, I can match them, and this way I came up with the matching of cardinality three, because I was able to match three pairs of boys and girls. Okay? So that's the, that's the idea. So now, let's define an algorithm that will try to do this matching. And our algorithm, we will call it, it's a greedy online algorithm, where basically um, in this online graph matching problem, when the new girl appears, any eligible boy, if there is an eligible boy that is not matched, let's just match that boy to that girl, right? And if no eligible, so no unmatched boys exist, uh, then we are not able to match that girl and, and we move on, right? And the question is, how good is this algorithm, right? So basically, the idea is uh, girls will arrive, we will see what, what are their preferences. If the, in, among their preferences there is at least one unma unmatched boy, so basically available boy, we will create that matching um, um, and, and we will continue. And of course if a girl arrives and reveals its matches, uh, her matches and all the boys that, sh that, uh, that, uh, that uh, are, are preferred by that node are already matched, there's nothing we can do, so we say sorry we cannot match it, right? So now the question is how good is this greedy matching algorithm. And the way we define the goodness in this case is that we have this notion of competitive ratio, right? And the competitive ratio is essentially saying how far away is the cardinality of the matching of this greedy algorithm from what the optimal algorithm would do, right? So we are saying for input i, suppose that the greedy algorithm produces the matching m sub greedy. This is a set of matched pairs, right? 
and then assume that the optimal algorithm would produce some other set of matching, let's call it M opt. Then we say that the competitive ratio is the minimum ratio between all possible inputs i, between the, the cardinality of the matching produced by greedy divided by the cardinality of the matching pro uh, in the optimal case, right? So in some sense, I'm asking at what fraction of the optimal solution is my greedy algorithm, right? I'm asking what is the greediest worst performance over all possible inputs. And when I say worst performance, worse with respect to what the optimal would do. Okay, so I'm always uh, uh, judging myself uh, to the bar of what is the optimal solution and how close to that would my greedy get. And this ratio is called competitive ratio because we are asking how competitive is greedy with respect to the, what the optimal would give us. Okay, so that's how we do it. So now let's try to compute the competitive ratio of, gre of this greedy matching algorithm, right? So let's consider the case where greedy doesn't give us the optimal solution, okay? And here is an example that we, I will show you uh, for the next few slides where I have boys on the left, girls on the right, the, the edges reveal preferences, uh, the blue edges is what the optimal solution would be, so it would be a perfect matching. But imagine that when the, the girl number A arrives, um, greedy assigns it, assigns her to the boy number two, so that when girl two arrives, now two is already taken, so she has to match with boy number three, so that C arrives, matches to boy number uh, four, and when the D arrives, D cannot match to three or four, because um, uh, both three and four are already, already taken, okay? So this is a case where greedy would do, uh, would give me suboptimal. And the reason why greedy would be suboptimal because here we were unlucky when the first uh, node A appeared, we chose to match it with node number one, not with node number, uh, sorry, we chose to match it with node number two and not with node number one. And you know, this can happen because we kind of among all eligible boys, we pick a random one and maybe we were just unlucky here. Okay, yes. Performance overall inputs, is that also worst performance over tiebreaking behavior? So we assume all the ties are broken in the worst possible way? You can imagine, huh, you can imagine either two options. One option is to measure, imagine that ties are broken in a worst possible way. Another way is to say I break ties at random. Or another way to say things is I break ties in some arbitrary but deterministic way. Okay? So, um, and essentially, what turns out is, you know, on super small examples like this, these things might, might matter, but in, in big graphs and in the limits, these things don't matter. The best way to think about it is that we break ties arbitrarily, but in a deterministic way. Okay? Um, so that's the best way to think of it. Okay? So let's now make some definitions. First, I will define the set G, which will be the set of girls that are matched in the optimal but they're not, not matched in greedy. So in our case, uh, the node uh, G would, uh, uh, the node D would be in set G, right? Because D is not matched in greedy, but is matched in the optimal. So that's the first definition, the set G. By definition, the number, the, the following holds, is right, the cardinality of the matching in uh, the optimal matching is, a, is, uh, is less than equal than the cardinality of the greedy matching plus the number of girls that were matched in the optimal but were not matched in greedy, right? So this is, this is essentially an equality because I'm saying optimal, uh, the size of the optimal solution is whatever greedy finds plus whatever are the girls that we were not able to match, match but were matched in greedy, okay? So this is uh, true by definition of how we define G. Now, the second thing is I will define uh, a set of boys B to be that are the boys who are linked with the girls in G. So in our case, B would be boys three and four because they link uh, to, a, to a girl in G, so to the node D, right? Um, and one thing we have to notice is that boys in B are already matched in the greedy, right? Why is that the case? Because if boys in B wouldn't have been matched in the greedy solution, this means they would be available which means I could match them to a girl in G, 
which would be, which is a contradiction. Okay. So basically, if there would exist such a non-matched boy boy B on the left hand side that is linked to a unmatched girl in G, then I could do that matching and I would contradict my definition of G. So what this means is that every boy in B is linked to, to an unmatched girl, but every boy in B has already been matched to some other girl, is unavailable, right? Because if that boy would be available, I could match it to the girl in G. But then the girl shouldn't be in G because uh, we say that the girl is only in G if it's matched in optimal but not in greedy, okay? So boys in B are linked to girls in G and boys in B are, uh, are matched in the greedy solution, all right? So um, what does this mean? This means is that the number of uh, the, uh, the, the cardinality of the optimal solution is greater or equal to the boys in B, right? Boys in B are matched in the greedy but linked to the girls in, uh, in uh, G. Um, and, uh, and this means that the, the cardinality of greedy must be bigger than the number of these boys in B. So that's the second observation, okay? So what do we have so far? We have defined G to be the boy, to be the girls matched in the optimal but not matched in greedy. We defined B to be boys adjacent to the girls in G. We, uh, uh, the first thing is we, we found the inequality that optimal is less than greedy plus size of G. And uh, uh, that greedy is bigger than B because all the boys in B have to be, are, all, are already matched in the greedy solution. Plus some, and so greedy mean, greedy contains at least the boys in B plus probably some other boys. Okay. Now that we have one and two, um, we need to um, also come up with another observation is that, that the optimal solution matches all girls in G to some boys in B. Right, it, what does this mean is that the number of girls in B has to be less than equal than the number of uh, boys in B, right? Because in the optimal solution, these girls in G have to be matched to some boy, which means that the number of girls versus the number of possible boys that they could be matched to, it has to be, the girls have to be fewer than the boys so that the, all the girls can be matched in the optimal solution. So the cardinality of G is less than cardinality uh, of B. Right? So what I can do now is I can go and combine equations uh, two and three. And out of this, I can get that size of G is less than the size of B is less than the um, uh, uh, size of uh, greedy solution, right? So now that I have done this, I can, uh, I will call this um, equation uh, uh, four here. Now in the next step, I will now compare equations one and four. So this is what's happening here. I still have my equation number, inequality number one or equation one that I proved before. We have just derived that G is less than B is less than greedy. Now if I combine uh, these two things together, then I ask what is the worst case, right? What is the, the worst case when these inequalities are satisfied and I will get the biggest difference in ratio between uh, optimal and greedy, right? And the worst case is attained when G equals B equals greedy. Right? So this will mean that the optimal is less than equal to greedy plus the size of G, which is equal to greedy. So it's here. So this means that optimal is less than two times greedy, which means that the competitive ratio, ratio between greedy and optimal is one half. Okay? So what this means is that um, the greedy algorithm will achieve competitive ratio of one half which means that the worst case performance of the greedy algorithm will be one half over all possible uh, inputs. So it will be at worst at the 50% of the optimal solution. So let me give you an example. Here, is my, uh, here are my boys, here are my girls. And essentially how this worst case performance can happen is that you know, um, as, as the girls come, I essentially make an, a mistake early on but that kind of penalizes me through the rest of the time, right? So here I would match one and A so that then I can match, uh, let's say two and B. And now in the second case, I can get something like this where C selects a, a already matched boy and a D comes and selects an already uh, matched boy, right? And uh, this means I was only able to match 
two girls out of four, even the optimal solution would be to match four, right? Is at the time when A appeared, I would match her with four. When B appeared, I could match her with three. So that when C came, one would still be available. And when D came, two would still be available. And that would be the optimal solution. But because we made two mistakes early on, we then got penalized in the second half. And that's kind of the worst that can happen, right? Is that basically for the first half of time, we make all the mistakes so that in the second half of time, we cannot match anyone. And that's the kind of the worst case scenario for the green. Okay, so that's about abstractly about the graph matching problem. Now I want to talk about web advertising and then connect back to how does it uh, relate to the um, to the online graph matching problem. Yes. The hack here to think that one greedy edge at most blocks another optimal edge. Great. That's a very nice way to think of it, right? Is that whenever we, in some sense, make a wrong greedy decision, this basically means that we prevent one optimal decision later on, right? So here I made two mistakes with A and B, so that later on, kind of I like I kind of prevented myself to use those to use those edges in some sense. So exactly, one greedy edge can kind of screw over at most one uh, uh, optimal edge. That's a great way to think of it. Thank you for saying that. It's super. Great. Anything else? All right, so web advertising, a, a bit of history. So this is not that old, right? It's a, basically the way this was started was in 1995, 1996, and the, the early history of web advertising is something that is called banner ads. And uh, if you open uh, a picture of, uh, if you go to newyorktimes.com, then banner ads would be these types of images. Here you see three of them, maybe four, on the New York Times page. And the way you would usually do this, right, is that New York Times uh, advertisers would come to um, uh, New York Times and they would say, um, you know, I'm willing to pay X amount of dollars per thousand impressions, right? So the same way as if you go to the, to the newspaper and you say, I want to put my ad in the newspaper. Newspaper says we print 100,000 100, copies uh, uh, a day. So 100,000 people will see your ad. So that is, I don't know, uh, $50,000, so half a dollar per person who sees the ad, right? Uh, the same thing was early imitated on the web, and this type of advertising is called CPM. Uh, this stands for cost per mile, where mile is thousand impressions, okay? So CPM advertising is essentially modeled after TV and newspaper ads, where all you pay is per impression, okay? Um, and of course, you can do this in an untargeted way, or you could do this in a demographically targeted way, where you can go, let's say, on Facebook today, and I say, I want to show my ad to uh, females from Palo Alto that have this age bucket, and I'm willing to pay 20 cents per impression. And uh, Facebook will say, thank you very much, and they will find the users to show that ad to, right? And the problem with these types of ads is that they lead to low engagement. They lead to what is called low click-through rates, because all that the advertiser is paying for is, is pay for impression. They don't pay for any kind of activity on the user side. So this me these types of ads generally lead to low return on investment, right? And of course, if you are Coca-Cola and you just want people to be aware that Coca-Cola exists, you are maybe, you are willing to do this type of advertising because you just want to do kind of brand awareness and, you know, you want to appear, um, somewhere and, you know, hope that people will memorize your brand. This is what is called, um, 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 uh, basically, this is what happens with CPM advertising. What actually happened then around the year 2000, there was a company that, uh, that innovated what is now called performance based advertising. And performance based advertising is the following, right? Is the case we were talking about is where advertisers bid on keywords, right? And then when somebody searches for that keyword, they, the, the highest bidder, uh, bidder's ad is shown. So this means that whenever somebody visits a website, there is an auction where the advertisers bid on that user and then the highest bidder wins, right? Um, and the important thing is that the advertiser only gets uh, um, charged if the ad is actually clicked on, right? Before in the CPM, 
the uh, the advertiser gets ch uh, charged per impression. Here, this is called CPC because it's cost per click, not cost per mille. In the CPC advertising, the 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 cost only gets you only get charged if the user clicks. And this is exactly the same model that was later adopted by Google in 2002 and is still the main advertising model uh, across the web, where basically it's performance-based advertising and where the advertiser only pays if the user clicks. There are also other types of advertising where it's not only per click, but you also can do by conversion, where you know you would put an ad on Google and if the user clicks through that ad and makes a transaction on the website, then only then you pay uh, you pay Google. So that's even more um, kind of strict version of engagement or performance. But for now, let's look at this uh, click-based or um, CPC-based type advertising, where the uh, basically the advertiser gets charged only if they get clicked. Right? Where where do these types of ads appear? If you go on Google and and search for something, uh, they they usually appear on the side. And these advertisers only get charged if you actually click the link. If you don't click the link, the advertiser doesn't pay Google any money. What this means is, right, like that these types of things are amazingly complex because these auctions have to happen in real time, right? You, you come, you search for, um, I don't know, Geico, and now other advertisers are like, oh, I want to advertise on the query Geico, and I'm willing to pay this much. And then out of that, Google decides, which of the three advertisers who are interested in advertising on that particular query at that particular time to that particular user actually gets to impress their uh, ad. And whoever gets to impress their ad, if the user actually clicks, then has to pay Google some money, whatever their bid was. Yes? For the advertisers, but what's the incentive for the advertisers? So you said it's clear why this is good for advertisers. Why is this good for the, uh, for the company? Uh, why Google is, wants to do this? Uh -huh. Why does Google want to do this? Um, because they want advertisers' business, right? So of course, go if Google would be lazy and say, "Hey, we'll just do uh, CPM," and sorry, we don't have a CPC product, advertisers would go elsewhere because advertisers want good, good return on their investment, right? So Google is amazingly good at deciding what ads to show. And uh, you wouldn't believe how many people at Google work on this problem. So essentially, like hordes and hordes of people work on this, like really. And if you look at Google, at Facebook, hordes and hordes of people work on this, right? That, because that's how these companies make money, right? So uh, what is what are the conclusions of this? This performance-based model uh, works much better than the display-based model because the incentives are more aligned. Right? Um, it is in Google's best interest to find most relevant ads to you so that you click them. So kind of that's why Google actually wants to do this or why companies want to do this because the incentives are aligned. And also the advertiser gets good return on investment because only they only pay for the people who actually transferred to their website, who actually clicked by themselves, right? So what is the interesting problem? What ads to show to a given query, to a given user? Right at that re at that time, right? And what will um, what are other problems, right? If I'm an advertiser, which search terms should I bid on, and how much should I bid, right? How much am I willing to pay, and what users am I willing to pay for? This is not the focus of today's lecture. We'll talk about what ads to show for a given query or for a given user. So here is now the the Google AdWords problem, right? We have a stream of queries that arrives to the search engine. And uh, several advertisers bid on each query. And then when a query queue sub I arrives, search engine must decide what subset of advertisers uh, are going to be shown, right? Out of the advertisers who reveal the preference for that query, we need to decide what, uh, what which subset of them to show, right? And what is the goal? The goal is to, minim to maximize the, the Google's revenue, right? We want to make as much money as possible, right? And here is one important detail here, right? Rather than, initially I said what, what um, uh, Overture did. They said, 
we will show the people the ads that have the highest bids. But showing the ads with the highest bids is not necessarily what you want to do if you want to maximize the revenue. And instead, what you really want to do is you want to show the ads that give you the highest expected revenue per click. So what this means is that you want to sort the ads by the amount that they bid times the probability that they will actually be clicked. And the probability of clicking is called CTR, click through rate, right? So you don't want to sort the ads by the amount they bid, but you want to sort by, by bid times probability of clicking because you want to maximize your expected revenue. And you only get revenue when the click occurs, and when the click occurs, you charge the bid amount of dollars. Okay? So, and in this case, of course, we need an online algorithm because these this queries arrive one at a time, and we need to decide what to do, right? So here is the idea. Adverti I have advertisers. Imagine a user came. I have the advertisers who give me different bids for that for that, for that user, for that query, for that instance. Now, I don't necessarily want to say, oh, I will show ads one and two, but I won't show ad number three. Because what I want to do is, I also want to estimate how likely is this user to click on the ad, right? And these click-through rates are usually around 1%, right? So, you know, the ad one may not be so relevant to the user, so the estimated probability of them clicking that ad is 1%. While this ad C, you know, maybe the advertiser is willing to pay a bit less, but the user is very likely to click it. So um, my estimated click-through probability is 2.5%, right? So my expected revenue by using the slot and showing that ad, here would be 1.25 cents. In the case B, it would be uh, 1.5 cents. And in, for the ad one, would only be one cent. So what I would want to do is I would want to show the ads B and C, because they have the highest expected revenue for me, right? So what this means, instead of sorting the advertisers or ads by bid, I want to sort them by the expected revenue. And uh, one thing that is, one challenge that is important is that in this case, the bids are known, but the CTR, the click-through rates are unknown, right? And these click-through rates are user-specific, right? So the CTR of an ad is unknown, um, and, uh, another, so I have to, I have to estimate it. I have to have a machine learning model that makes prediction for this ad, for this user, what's the probability of clicking. And then the second thing is that advertisers have limited budget and, uh, they bid on multiple queries. And what this means is that I may, I have to be careful how I allocate advertisers budget, right? And this is where the online matching problem will come from. Okay. So there are two complications, right? One is how do I deal with finite budgets? And then the second one is that the CTR of an ad is unknown, right? The problem with budgets is that each advertiser has a limited budget. They say, I'm willing to spend $100 a day uh, on this ad. And I want to show this ad on a, this subset of queries, right? And the search engine guarantees that advertiser will not be charged more than the daily budget, right? Of course, Google can, 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 can show that ad 10 million times, but if the, if the advertiser has um, a $100 daily budget, th this means that Google won't be able to charge for more than the $100. So this means that these online advertising systems have to be super precise and super uh, real time because after you exhausted the daily budget and you, f you keep showing that ad, you cannot charge for it. So you are losing money, right? So it's, so this is an important complication. And then around budgets. And then the second one is the, the click-through rate, which is, you know, how do I predict the click-through rate between each ad query pair? Um, and this likelihood might be, might be different, right? So, you know, you could have advertiser one that bids a lot, but has the low click probability and advertiser two that bids less, but has a much higher click probability. And the problem is, that CTR is both kind of predicted and also measured historically, and it's usually kind of averaged over a time period, right? And about the CTR, the things that we won't talk about is actually click-through rate is position dependent, meaning the ads that are appear higher up on the page are more likely to be clicked than the ads towards the bottom of the page, the same as with search results, right? So 
ad number one will always be clicked more than the ad number two. And you have to kind of de-bias your CTR estimate from this position bias. And that's a very important problem. And then what complications about CTR are we going to talk about next lecture? Is this exploration versus exploitation trade-off where you don't, when a new ad arrives, you, and you've never seen it, you don't know what is its click-through rate. So then the problem becomes this notion of what do you do? A brand new ad you've never seen has a click-through rate of zero. So if you just assume it has click-through rate of zero, you will never show it. But then you will never discover how good of an ad that really is. So you have this notion of exploration where you basically say, shall I take the brand new ad and just show it a couple of times that I see who bites on it versus Shall I just keep showing the ads that I know are good and I, I have shown them uh, many times before and I know who they are good for, right? And the same, this kind of explore exploit problem happens in recommender systems where let's say a new song arrives or a new movie arrives and you haven't shown that movie to anyone. So you don't know how good it is and what subgroup of people will like it. And the, when a user arrives to let's say Netflix, you could say, oh, I'll just, recommend the movies that I already know this person is going to like because I have a lot of data about it? Or should I maybe just show them the, the movie um, that I'm very uncertain about, but it's a very new one, and by showing that the movie to that user, I'm going to learn something about the movie. This is called the exploration. So what I want to talk about now is, so this is what we'll talk about Thursday, and it's an important uh, problem. What I'm going to talk about now is this online algorithms for matching advertisers to queries or to matching advertisers to users. Okay, so that's what we are going to do next. Um, are there any questions? All right, so moving on. Uh, what's the Google AdWords problem, right? We are given a set of bids by advertisers on the search queries. Um, let's say we are given uh, a search uh, a click through rate uh, for each advertiser query pair. We are just assuming this is given to us. Um, we are given uh, 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 the budget for each advertiser. Let's say we are given a monthly budget or a daily budget. Um, and uh, we are given a limit on the number of ads to be displayed with each query. Let's say three or let's say one. Um, and uh, what, are, what are we trying to do? We try to respond to each search query with a set of advertisers such that the size of the num of the set of the advertisers is no larger than the limit on the number of ads per query that each advertiser uh, has bidded on that search query um, and that each advertiser has enough budget to pay uh, in, a, in the case that, you know, if you show that ad, the user will click, um, we still have money to pay for that click, right? We don't want to uh, uh, give away clicks for free. We want to be able to have budget for the, from that advertiser to pay for the click if it occurs, okay? So these are the conditions we want to do, okay? So here is, um, we already talked about the greedy algorithm. And if we simplify this setting a bit, then our greedy algorithm of matching boys and girls applies uh, very nicely here, right? Where, what are we simplifying? We will say that there is one ad shown for each query, right? We can match. Uh, um, one, one girl with one boy. Uh, all advertisers have the same budget B. Um, all ads are, let's say, equally likely to be clicked. And the bid of each ad is the same. It's, uh, let's say, one dollar. Okay? These are just simplifying assumptions. And under these simplifying assumptions, I could apply this uh, greedy algorithm that we talked about before, where basically for a query, I pick any advertiser who has uh, bid that for that query. And we already know that the competitive ratio of that algorithm is one half, right? So what would this mean is if I can make a if in the optimal scenario, I would, I could make a million dollars a day, this algorithm will make at least 500,000 or more, right? So we know that I'll be, that we'll be making at least 50% of all possible money that it is to be made. So it's quite good. We have a guarantee how well we are doing with respect to the algorithm that would actually know uh, how the future looks like. Okay, so it's useful. Right, so let's now keep talking about what is what are some bad scenarios for this greedy algorithm. And I'll give you one. Imagine that I have two advertisers A and B. Advertiser A bids on query X. 
um, and advertise uh, sorry advertiser A bids on query X, advertiser B bids on X and Y. Okay, um, and both have the same budget of four dollars. And uh, imagine that the query stream is I first see four instances of X and then I see four instances of Y. And uh, what would the optimal uh, solution be? The optimal solution would be that when the queries X arrive, assign them to A, so that when queries Y arrive, the budget of B is still free, and, and I assign uh, B to the to Y. What would be the worst case that can happen for greedy? It would be that the greedy does exactly the opposite, right? When the queries X arrive, uh, the the greedy says, "Oh, I could choose A and B, A or B. Let me choose B." So that then after four uh, slots, I have exhausted B's budget. Now the queries Y arrive. Um, I, uh, A does not bid on the queries Y. So I would only be able to, to select B, but B is out of budget, so I can select nothing, right? So in this case, we would spend $4, and the optimal solution would spend all $8. It would exhaust both advertisers' budgets, right? So this would be the optimal for the queries X use the advertiser A, so that when queries Y arrive, you can use them for B. And this is the competitive ratio of one half, right? Even if we do the worst possible thing, we still do 50% um, uh, of what the optimal solution can do, right? So the competitive ratio is one half, right? And this is the worst case, right? One thing about the worst case you were asking me before, the, the, the only thing is we break ties in an arbitrary way, but in a deterministic way, right? We always resolve the draws in the same way. And if this is the assumption, then the following analysis holds. Is right. No random tie breaking, but consistent deterministic tie break. Whatever, whatever it is. Okay. Are there any questions about the greedy algorithm? So everyone sees how it works? Yeah? All right. Good. So this is now the simplest way. So now I'll give you an algorithm that actually works much better. Um, this algorithm will allow us, will give us, I think, 75% of the, of the budget. So, so it's, uh, its competitive ratio will be three quarters. So it will be much better than green. Um, and here is how this algorithm works. It's, uh, it's called balance. Um, and the rule it uses is very simple, right? It says, for each query, pick the advertiser with the largest unspent budget. Right, so whenever a query arrives and um, uh, multiple advertisers want to show the uh, show 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 uh, the ad for it, I'll pick the advertiser who has the most unspent money. Right, and again, I'm breaking times arbitrarily, but in a deterministic way. Right, so let me give you an example. I I have uh, advertisers A and B, same as before. A bids on X, B bids on X and Y. Both have budget of four. Uh, the sequence of the queries is that I first see four instances of X, and then I say four instances of Y. Um, now, what would the balance do? Here is what the balance would do, right? First, uh, the X arrives, and it chooses A. So that now the second X arrives, uh, A has $3 left, B has $4 left. So now we choose B, because B has $4 left. It has ha largest unspent budget. So now I chose one A, one B. They both have $3 left. So when the next X arrives, I choose A, right? Again, I break ties arbitrarily, let's say alphabetically. Now A has $2 left, B has $3 left, so that when the fourth X arrives, now I choose the eligible advertiser with most unspent budget. This would be um, advertiser B, so um, I put it here. Now uh, I use two units of money for A, two units of money for B, so that when uh, queries Y arrive, I can do two more uh, impressions of ad B, okay? So I'm able to make to spend six dollars, while the optimal, as we had before, would be able to spend uh, eight dollars, right? So uh, and in general, for the balance algorithm on two advertisers, the competitive ratio will be three quarters, right? So we are spending six out of eight possible dollars. So that's three quarters, right? So in general, what we are going to prove is that balance for two advertisers gives me competitive ratio three quarters. So it means it's making 25% more money than what the greedy algorithm would be making, which uh, can be quite, quite significant. Okay, so let's try to analyze the balance algorithm. 
But before I do that, any questions about how this works? Okay, so everything clear, let's analyze it. So here is how we will analyze this algorithm. So we will do this without the loss of generality. We will assume there are two advertisers A and B, and they both had, have the same budget B. And we will also assume that the optimal solution advertisers both advertisers budgets, right? Um, and this is without loss of generality because if the optimal solution cannot uh, exhaust advertisers budget, then that budget we can do nothing with it. So we can just throw it away and for the purpose of analysis assume that both budgets gets exhausted, right? Um, so if this is the optimal solution, then one thing is that the balance must exhaust at least one of the um, one of the two advertisers budget. Why is, why is that not, why is that the case? If, if both advertisers would still have a uh, un, um, um, uh, uh, unexhausted budget, then you know whenever balance makes a mistake, which means both advertisers bid on the query, but we assign it to the wrong uh, to the wrong advertiser, the advertiser's unspent budget only decreases. So this means that because the optimal uh, exhausts both budgets, this means that one of the budgets will for sure get exhausted, right? Because it means that when we we Essentially here, when we make a mistake, uh, we further uh, decrease the budget of the advertiser whose budget will be exhausted anyway. So in the end, that advertiser's budget kind of for sure must be exhausted because we assigned the queries that should be assigned to it to it, plus we assigned additional mistakes to it, which further decrease the budget. So at least one of the two budgets has to be exhausted, right? Let's assume that the balance exhausted exhausts A2's budget. And the way, uh, but at the same time allocates x queries fewer than the optimal solution does. So this means that the revenue of balance will be two times b, right? I have two advertisers, each with the budget b minus x. These are these are the the queries we were we me, we were not able to allocate, right? So optimal solution would exhaust both advertisers' budgets, so it would be uh, b, um, while the the balance will get. Um, We'll get the revenue of two times b minus x. So now we want to figure out what x is. Okay, so our goal is to figure out what x is. And if we know what x is, then we can take two b minus x divided by b, and we'll get the uh, divided by two b, and we will get the competitive ratio. That is our plan: figuring out what the value of x, which is the um, how many fewer queries we allocate than the optimal solution would. Okay, so here is the, the picture. I have advertisers A1 and A2. Um, uh, B, the bar shows the budget, and the color in the bar shows what queries got uh, assigned to each advertiser, right? So it would mean that blue queries are allocated to A1 in the optimal solution, and the green queries are allocated to A2 in the optimal solution. And how these things will look in general? In general is that what will happen is that some of the blue queries will be assigned to A2, some of the green queries will be assigned to A1, and because of that, um, one budget will be exhausted, another budget will be left unspent, and this is the amount of unspent budget, right? Because we won't be able to allocate this here, okay? So this is kind of how, how we are going to reason about this. And uh, what is uh, important to note? It's important to know that the optimal solution that I denote up here will have will exhaust both budgets, so it will have revenue of two times b. And in our case, uh, when the balance does, we will have revenue of b plus b minus x, right? So this is the amount of money we are not able to spend. These are not used or unallocated uh, queries, and the height of this is x, which is here. And then if this is x, we will call this y, and x plus y equals b, which is the budget. Okay? Um, and uh, what is our claim? Our claim will be that y is greater than x. Our claim will be essentially that we spend at least half of A1's budget, right? If we exhaust A2, we have to spend at least half of A1's budget. And if we spend at least half of the A1's budget, this means that we spend half plus one out of two, so it's uh, 1.5 divided by two, so that's three quarters, right? So 
if um, if y is greater than x, then the, the minimum revenue is obtained when x equals to y. So x equals y is b over 2, which means that, uh, that the minimum revenue for balance is 3b divided by 2, which would mean competitive ratio is 3 quarters, which is what we want to prove. So let's now go and figure out how, how do we prove this. And the way we'll prove this is to analyze two separate cases. One case would be trivial, and one will be less trivial. Okay, so this is the setting, queries, and so on. All right, so here is our picture. We assign, we, we exhaust uh, the budget of A2 um, because we made mistakes and took some of the queries from A1 to the advertiser 2. Now we cannot take these queries, uh, uh, the green one, and assign them here. So they become unassigned, and that's kind of the loss we gain. All right? The, the observation to notice is that unassigned queries should have been assigned to uh, A2. And these uh, queries, the blue ones, should be assigned uh, to, to A1, right? Because if we could assign them to uh, uh, A, uh, these queries to A1, then we would still have budget on the side uh, of A2, right? So the goal for us to show is that the amount of budget of blue queries that we assigned to A1 is at least half, right? Um, so the first case is when the balance assigns at least half of the blue queries to A1, right? So this is the first case, right? Where we assigned at least half of the queries to, to uh, A1, uh, that should go to A1 to A1, and some less than half of the queries of A1 got assigned to A2, and then the green, the rest, the rest, the green queries ate up all the budget, right? In this case, Basically, I'm assuming that that uh, y is at least one half. If the y if y is at least one half, then the then the competitive uh, ratio will be at least three quarters because our revenue will be at least b plus something that is more than one half of, uh, more than half of the b. So we will get three b divided by two uh, will be the minimum of our revenue. So this is the the easy case where essentially the mistake that happens is that we took some blue queries, assigned them to uh, to A1 and uh, to A2, and then exhausted the budget of A2. So now I want to show you the second case, right, where the balance assigns more than half of the blue queries to A2. So it makes more than half of the mistakes, right? Whatever it took here, in a, it assigned over. And now the question is: Am I still able to argue? that the amount of spent budget on A1 is greater than one half, right? How can I argue this, right? The way I can argue this is the following. I can consider the last blue query that was assigned to, uh, to uh, A2, right? Because let's, um, and if I take the last query that was assigned to A2, then here is the crucial observation, right? Uh, you have to remember that balance assigns the query to the advertiser with most unspent budget, okay? So now things should click, right? So if I'm making the assumption that more than half of the blue queries got assigned to A2, and I'm looking at the last query that got assigned to A2, this means this last query got assigned to A2 because A2 has had more unspent budget than A1, okay? And if I'm assuming I, I spent at least half of the, uh, the blue queries here, it means that I must have already spent half of the budget here so that, uh, uh, so that the, the, the A2 had more unspent budget and the blue query got assigned here rather than there. Okay? So because this means that at this time when I was assigning the last blue query to A2, A2's uns unspent budget must have been at least as big as A1's unspent budget, right? So this means if I want this bar to go over one half, right, over 50%, this means this bar must, must be over 50% because these blue queries otherwise would be assigned here. So it means that some of the green queries must have been assigned here, right? And that the amount of unspent budget here was smaller than, than in A2 so that I decided to assign the blue query to, uh, to A2, even though I, sh I should have assigned it to A1, right? And because of, uh, because of this argument, 
This means that at least as many queries have been assigned to A1 as they have been assigned to A2. And if we assume that at least that, you know, more than half of the blue queries are here, this means more than half of the budget of, of A1 have been, has been spent when this assignment happened, because otherwise I wouldn't assign it. I would assign it to the guy with the more unspent budget. Okay? So again, what does this mean? At this, this means that at this point we have already assigned at least half of the, half of the queries to A2, which means that also we have assigned at least half of the queries to A1 as well. So it means again, the, we have spent at least half of the, half of the budget of A1. So in total we spent full budget plus half of the budget. So again, we get the, the result that Y is greater than one half, which means the competitive ratio is greater than uh, three quarters, okay? So here is the result. The result is that the revenue is minimum where X and Y equals one half, which means that the minimum, uh, the balance, uh, the minimum revenue of balance is three B over two. The optimal is two B. So the, the competitive ratio of balance versus optimal is three quarters. And uh, the key step in this proof lies here and it relies on the, the crucial thing here is that we are using the algorithm and that we remember that the algorithm assigns a query to the, to the, to the advertiser with highest unspent budget, right? And if you want now the, the, the queries uh, that should be assigned to A1 to go to A2, which means that they could go to either of the two, this means that here we must have spent um, enough, more than half of the budget, so that these blue queries uh, can, per, can be even assigned to A, which means A, A2 must have had bigger unspent budget than A1, right? And this gives us uh, the proof. Okay, um, great. So what, this is what I wanted to say about this proof. Um, are there any questions, right? So the case one is easy. The case two, the only thing we have to use is the definition of the algorithm and, and then the argument holds, okay? Any questions? Please don't be so quiet, all okay? right? No questions, all right, good. So moving on. So this is for two advertisers and the simplifying assumptions. In general, we can prove that with multiple advertisers, the worst case, Competitive ratio of balance will be one minus one over E. Uh, e is uh, 2.7, right? So this is about 0.63. So if I have multiple uh, advertisers, balance will uh, give me um, the, the competitive ratio of 0.63. And what is interesting is that there is no online algorithm that gives me better competitive ratio. So this is the best we can hope for, period, right? So what I wanna give you now is give you, the, give you the analysis of what is this uh, worst case performance when this competitive ratio of 0.63 appears, okay? So I will repeat again what I just said and what is important to remember. We proved that for two advertisers, competitive ratio of balance is three quarters. That's the first thing, two advertisers, three quarters. If I have arbitrary number of advertisers, then the competitive ratio is 0.63, right? So a problem with two advertisers is easier than the problem with a very large number of advertisers. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is, I didn't give you the proof, but uh, uh, the paper of balance also shows that this is the optimal you can hope to do. So there is there exists no better algorithm that would have better or higher competitive ratio, okay? That's the idea. Now let's see how do I define, derive this, uh, uh, in what case would this happen? It's a very intricate case, right? So we have N advertisers, A1 to AN, and let's say every advertiser has budget B uh, that is greater than N. Um, we, will, uh, we will have queries appear in rounds, and in each round uh, um, uh, uh, we, will, uh, we will have, uh, uh, B queries to appear. So in total, we will we will have n times B queries uh, to appear. In each round, there will be B queries. Okay, um, and the way the bidding works is the following. Uh, because this is the worst case, I can kind of make it 
what uh, I can make, uh, this is very carefully chosen. But the idea is that in round one, uh, all the advertisers bid. In the round two, advertisers two to the end bid. In round three, uh, advertisers three to the end bid, right? So the idea is that the bidding has this kind of triangle shape, right? So what does this mean, right? This means that the optimal solution would assign all, all queries in round one to A1, all queries in round two to A2, all queries in round three to A3, so that in round N, where only advertiser N bits, all queries could be uh, assigned to advertiser N, okay? So this is what the optimal solution would be. So basically, exhaust A1 first, then A2, A3, A4, right? And what balance will do, balance will try to spread the budget across all the advertisers, right? And what we will analyze is how, how, how bad is that, right? So as I said, the optimal allocation is that in a given round, I, we allocate all our queries to the advertiser I, right? Because this has this funny uh, uh, triangular shape. That's why this is the optimal thing, right? And in this case, we will, we will be able to spend all the advertisers' budgets, so we will make money n times b, okay? So what will the balance do in this case? L right, like the way, if you think these are the budgets of the advertisers, what balance will do is, in the round one, rather than spending the advertiser A1 budget fully, and then not utilize other advertisers' budget, the, the, the balance will kind of evenly spread the queries across all the advertisers, right? If there are big queries that appear in, in one round, and uh, there is N advertisers, then B over N of every advertiser's budget will be eaten, right? Because why is that? Because balance always assigns a query to the advertiser with highest unspent budget, okay? So this means that after the first round, about all the advertisers will have about equal unspent budget, right? Now we are at round two, and at the, to the queries of round two, everyone but A1 bids. So what will happen in round two? Again, basically, every advertiser's budget will be equally spent, right? And how much of the budget will be spent? Uh, B is the number of queries that, that appear in, uh, in each round. But now in round two, we only have N minus one eligible advertisers. So each advertiser will spend B over N minus one uh, fraction of each, um, or uh, dollars of its budget, right? And then when, uh, you know, in round uh, three, again, in round three, only, only advertisers three to N are eligible, right? So again, what balance will do, it always assigns the query to the advertiser that is eligible, but has largest unspent budget. So again, it means that only advertisers three to N we will uh, spend their budgets. We will spend each advert uh, the, uh, the same amount of every advertiser's budget. How much are we going to spend? We have big queries, and we assign them equally between, uh, you know, advertisers three to n. So it means we uh, divide that to the uh, b divided by n minus two, right? And that's the amount of budget that we are going to spend, right? And now you can see as the rounds progress. We will be kind of building up this triangle. And this means that this, for example, A1's budget will remain unspent, and A2's budget will remain unspent, and A3 will remain unspent, and so on and so forth, right? Because we are kind of smearing out or splitting the ads across the advertisers, and the optimal solution would be to take all these impressions and put them here so that all the green impressions can be put here and all the yellow here so that for the later rounds, uh, we still have budget uh, to allocate in the later rounds, right? This is how we set up the problem, okay? Are there, so what should be clear is that we came up with this um, weird worst case assignment of how advertisers bid, and now I gave you uh, some intuition how the budgets of these advertisers are going to get exhausted over time, and uh, because the, the algorithm always assigns an ad to to the advertiser with largest unspent budget, these budgets will kind of be spent to equal levels as time progresses, as rounds progress. Um, are there any questions? Everything good? Yes? Okay, so now 
that we know how this works, let's try to kind of do some derivations and, and try to do some math. So the first thing is the following. Balance assigns each of the queries in round one to n to uh, advertisers. And after k rounds, the sum of the allocations to each advertiser k to n, right? So from, you know, k to n is the following, right? Is the, uh, so basically it means that all the advertisers from the case advertiser to the last one will have the same amount of budget left. And this will be a summation where I goes from um, one to k. Uh, it's the total number of queries versus the number of el eligible advertisers, right? At round one, I have uh, n advertisers, right? There are n advertisers in the blue. At round two, I get n minus one advertisers, right? The green guys. At round three, I get n minus two advertisers, the blue guys, and so on and so forth, right? So this means that, that at round k, the amount of spend budget for advertisers from k to n will be equal. Like I have it here from advertise after three rounds, the advert, the, the amount of budget spent by the advertisers from three to n is all the same, and it is, and the amount is b over n plus b over minus n plus b over n minus two, right? This is this summation that corresponds to this summation up here, okay? So this is how much budget can be spent for all the advertisers from advertiser k on, onwards after k, k rounds, right? Um, are there any questions? So this is clear, right? The reason, the reason for this is the way balanced algorithm works and always assigns to the advertiser with most unspent budget, which means that all budget will be kind of spent with the equal rate among all the eligible advertisers. So now, what is our goal? Our goal is the following. If we find the smallest k such that the amount of spent budget for that k advertiser is greater than b, this means that uh, that we we cannot assign any more queries to the advertiser, right? So because it means that from advertiser k to n, we have exhausted all the budgets, right? Uh, why is that? Because we are assuming that that in round k, all, only advertisers k to n are eligible. So if we find the first such k where the amount of spent budget uh, increase is greater than the amount of budget of the advertiser, this means. Um, that in the later rounds, we won't be able to alloc allocate any queries to any advertisers anymore, right? So essentially, I'm saying, how long can I run k until the sum of these uh, uh, bars reaches the top, right? That's what I'm saying. So one way to think of this is, right, that at every round, <coughs> if I think of an advertiser, at every round, I spend some fraction of advertiser's budget. In round one, I spend n over b over n fraction uh, amount of advertisers budget in round two i spent additional b over n minus one of advertisers budget and so on and so forth right and what i'm asking is how many of these fractions do i need to sum up so that they sum up to the total budget i have and the question is how many terms do i have to add add together so how many rounds do i have to go through before i add, uh, before i spend the the budget b of the advertiser, okay? Um, now, notice if I take this thing up there and I divide it by, by B, then this is what I'm left with, okay? So essentially, rather than thinking of dollars, I can now think of the fraction of the advertiser's budget that gets spent, right? So um, if I have N advertisers and I have one unit of budget um, or uh, one, one, one unit of query, then, and I split that evenly across n advertisers, I spend one over n fraction of every advertiser's budget, right? And then in round two, I have n minus one eligible advertisers. I spread that across, I spread that query across all of them. So it is one over n minus one. So that's, you know, the amount of budget I expend uh, after two rounds. And you know, this would be after three, after four, and, and the sum of these numbers is the amount of budget or the fraction of budget I spend after k rounds. And I'm asking, how long can I run k until the amount of spent budget equals the total budget of the advertiser, which, which is one, right? I took b, 
but I divided everything by b, so I, I'm left with 1. Okay? So here is one fact that we need to know. And one thing we need to know is that the sum of uh, over i of the 1 over i uh, equals natural logarithm of n. So basically, the, the, I, the, this is the result due by Euler that says that the sum of the first n harmonic numbers is, is, uh, is, uh, is equal to, to the logarithm of n. Okay? Um, this is the fact, right? So even though these numbers get smaller and smaller and smaller, they keep adding to bigger and bigger number. That is of the, that is of, uh, sum of log n. Okay, so what does this mean? In our case, you can think we are spending the budget from this side, right? But really, the, uh, the, 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 uh, Euler's, uh, harmonic numbers go from this side, right? So it's one plus one half plus one third plus so on, all the way to 1 over n, and the sum of this thing is log n. That's according to the formula above, right? So what do I want? What I want is to say, what is the sum of the lowest k harmonic numbers so that they sum to 1, okay? So if these lowest k harmonic numbers sum to 1, this means that the first n minus k harmonic numbers have to sum to log n minus 1, right? The entire thing sums to 1. These guys, uh, sorry, the entire thing sums to log n. This, these guys seem sum to 1. So then whatever is here has to be log n minus 1. Okay? So this is what we know from here. Right? So if the sum of the last k harmonic numbers is 1, this implies the following. It implies that the sum of the first n minus k, right? If there is n total and here is k, this means this is n minus k harmonic numbers is uh, equals to uh, log n minus um, uh, n minus k. So this would mean that this is the same as log of n minus 1 because this sums to 1. If I ask what this is, this is log n divided by log e, right? Because log of e equals 1, okay? So that's the first observation. The second observation is that the sum of the first n minus k harmonic numbers is log n minus k. Okay? So now I can basically equate this equation with that equation. And if I do that, I get that n minus k equals n over e. Okay? So now I can uh, solve this equation for uh, k. And I obtain that k equals n times 1 minus 1 over e, right? So this means that in the number of rounds that is equal to n times 1 minus 1 over e, I spent the advertiser's uh, budget, right? So what did we just show? We showed that the balance will run in our case for n times 1 minus uh, 1 over e rounds. And after that, we won't be able to allocate any advertiser's budget. So the revenue of balance will be b, times n, b times the number of rounds we run, which is n times 1 minus 1 over e. The optimal revenue would be uh, b times n. So the competitive ratio is this factor 1 minus 1 over e. Okay? So um, this is what I wanted to say. So let me quickly conclude with the last two things, right? In the arbitrary version of the problem, we have arbitrary bids and we have arbitrary budgets, right? And uh, in this case, you can consider the following thing. You can consider that you have one query um, and advertiser i. So it means that the advertiser, uh, uh, that the bid will be x sub b, and the budget will be uh, b sub i. So this is the bid of the advertiser and the budget of the advertiser. And um, in, general, in this general case, the performance of the balance can be quite bad, right? So consider I have two advertisers, um, advertiser one, bids on query one and has the budget of 110, and advertiser two um, has the uh, bid of 10 and has a budget of 100. And uh, if you consider that we see 10 instances of Q, then the balance will always select A1 because it has higher unspent budget. And because of this, we will earn $10, $1 per every impression, even though what we should have done is show the advertisers two, two ads because they are willing to pay $10 
and we would exhaust their budget, right? So in general, the performance of the balance algorithm can be bad if the budgets are uneven, because then um, in this case, right, because A1's budget is bigger, we will use cheaper impressions rather than to use more expensive impressions, right? And uh, here is how to generalize balance that it avoids this trap. The generalization of balance goes the following. Again, we say we have we consider a query Q. We have B the I, we have the bit X sub I, and we have the budget on that query B sub I. And let M sub I be the amount of the budget we have spent so far. So we will we will define F sub I to be the fraction of the budget we have spent. So this is one minus the total available budget minus uh, over the uh, the spent budget. And uh, we can now define this function that basically say that multiplies the bid with one minus e raised to the fraction of unspent budget. And if you now allocate the query q to the bidder with the largest value of this function, then what we can show is that we will achieve the same competitive ratio that I showed you, which is 0.63, right? So essentially, if we are rescaling the budget based on the fraction of the budget we have spent, so that we are renormalizing um, the budgets of advertisers, then we can still achieve the right competitive ratio. So um, with this, I will stop. Thank you. Sorry for running two minutes over. <laughs>